Hello and welcome. This is James from the DSO Imager channel. Tonight I'm going to go and show my processing workflow that I used for this shot of Thor's helmet. Now what you're seeing here is the raw stack. Uh, it's 18 hours. I think it's like 18 hours and 10 minutes of um, data. It's taken with the Celestron Edge HD8. Uh, the camera is a ZWO ASI 533 MC, so one shot color camera here. The filter is the Optolong L Ultimate filter, and the uh, mount that I used was a EQ6. Now, this isn't the first time that I shot Thor's helmet. I actually shot it uh, three years ago with very similar equipment. Uh, pull this up here. So, this is uh, yeah, 2021. Same uh, scope, the 8-inch uh, Edge HD, same camera, the ASI 533MC, uh, but I use the L-Extreme on this shot. Now, other than the difference of filter, uh, this was, sh I was pretty new to my Edge and the 533 and the location that I was at, and I hadn't quite learned how to get the most out of everything. So total integration time for this one's actually more at 19 hours. But notice I was shooting uh, 240 second subs. This time around I was shooting 10 minute subs or uh, 600 seconds. So uh, that was one major difference. But it'll be interesting to compare uh, the results. I mean looking at it right off the bat you can already see more information here uh, then you can see in this one, which is uh, interesting. And this is not even processed. This is just straight. Uh, this is um, using the auto stretch. So let's see how, uh, how this turned out. All right. So first thing I did was um, uh, use Blur Exterminator with the correct only function to correct the stars. And you can actually see it. Zoom in, and there we go. So that does a marvelous job of cleaning those stars up. Blur Exterminator is definitely worth it. Next up was uh, dynamic background extraction. Now, there really r wasn't much of a gradient. There, I know there's that new tool out there um, that came out for Pixinsight. What is it? Uh, yeah, this, this guy here, gradient correction. I don't believe I attempted to use this on this image. I processed this image right around the same time it came out. I may have tried it and didn't see much benefit uh, to it. So I think that tool is really good if you're having a lot of gradient and probably for wide field shots. When you get in tight at longer focal lengths with a scope like the Edge and a little camera like the 533, your field of view is really tight. Gradients tend to not be too much of an issue. So the dynamic background extraction was really about uh, improving the, um, uh, the contrast. And you can see the difference here. All right, so next was um, color calibration. Now, you can see that I'm just doing an unlinked auto stretch, right? If I link the channels and do an auto stretch see how we have a, a it's more emphasis on the red now which is interesting but um, it's a narrow band image right we got three nanometers on HA and three nanometers on O3 uh, O3 so uh, since I was going to use the gradient uh, uh, what's the name of that tool I always forget the name uh, <laughs> hyperbolic, yeah, uh, generalized hyperbolic stretch. So since I was going to use that to stretch this image, ultimately, I wanted to get the color calibration set first, and I wanted it to look at a good state with the channels locked. So I used kind of an old school method. Uh, you see here that I've got red, blue, green. So what I did is I took this image here, and I just split the channels using this button here, split RGB channels. And so that breaks it, breaks it up into the red, green, and blue channels. And then I used linear fit with uh, blue as a reference. 
So we just go to linear fit. There you can see it's already there. So you put the blue in there and then you just drag and drop this to apply this linear fit function to the red and green. And then you recombine them and uh, you end up with this and with a linked auto stretch all right, it now it now looks actually very similar to what the unlinked auto stretch looked like. All right, so next was blur exterminator. Only this time I did not use the correct only function, but I used the um, uh, the automatic PSF, so we can get a uh, good uh, application of deconvolution on this image. And these are the values that I ended up using. And uh, you notice a preview box here. So I always do a preview of a critical area and do some test runs of different settings to kind of tune the value that I want. Uh, and then once I came to this, I applied it to the entire image and that got me this. So now the stars are nice and tight and the detail that we're getting in the nebula is pretty good. So there. That's uh, before Blur Exterminator and after Blur Exterminator. I mean, this area right here, well, we can look at the comparison at the end of the video at my first attempt, but certainly having the ability to utilize Blur Exterminator was uh, is a big part of it because this whole area on my old image looks kind of mushy, especially this area where you got this dust in here. And, Blur Exterminator cleans that up really well. Alrighty, uh, next was to get the stars off of there. So, uh, there. Oh, wait, actually, before we did the stars, check this out. So, I, I've started doing my initial noise reduction run while the image is still linear, right? So, we're, we're still not stretched here. And this is really not a noisy image at all. We got a little bit of noise here and a little bit in the darker areas as usual. And of course, uh, um, noise exterminator, which is what I use, has a uh, sharpening effect as well. But um, you have to go really light on the detail, especially after you've run blur exterminator. If you try to do additional sharpening on it, it it'll it'll do some weird things. Uh, but we can see the effect that I got here. So this is with the noise, and now there's noise exterminator. So you can see that there's not really a lot of change here on the brighter parts. But the background, which was a bit darker, cleaned up really nice. Okay, so after that, I removed the stars using star exterminator and we end up with uh, this here. So I think this data is actually pretty decent because this looks good. <laughs> it looks good already. It's like I can just apply an auto stretch to it and call it done. Uh, really nice bright targets and getting a decent amount of integration time on them really make for easy astrophotography, I think. Alrighty, so uh, let's see, next was to stretch. So as I mentioned before, I used generalized hyperbolic stretch. So here we have our image without the stretch and the initial stretch, I ended up with this. And then I gave it a little bit more of a stretch uh, because what I really wanted to do with this image is pull out a lot of this deeper stuff. I, I mean, you especially notice it in my first shot. I mean, you don't see any of it. Uh, you can see a little bit over here, but yeah, you don't really see much of the background, but this whole thing has got stuff in here. So I wanted to try to pull that out. I, honestly, I wanted to get more than 18 hours, but um, we're, we're kind of in the spring, early spring now here in Central Texas, and uh, the weather becomes very unstable. Uh, there's a reason <laughs> my images from late summer and winter can get 20, 30, 40, 50 hours of exposure. And uh, for galaxy season, I'm averaging around 10 hours of exposure. It's just, it's just the season that I'm in. Now, what I did from here is I took this image straight into Photoshop and I gave it some work using the camera raw filter. Now, if you're curious to see what I do in Photoshop, 
the previous video I posted, uh, I think it was a couple weeks ago, I actually did a full-blown walkthrough. Uh, actually, it was more like I processed the image live. And you can see what I do in Photoshop. It's pretty much the same thing with that camera raw filter. Uh, it's mostly adjusting the in the effects setting, the dehaze and um, clarity, and then dealing with uh, the light values a little bit. And I may have boosted vibrance just a tiny bit. So when I when all said was done with Photoshop, I brought it back into PixInsight and ended up with, with this here. Now, I actually wasn't too thrilled with the outcome here, and I very nearly stopped and started over. Uh, my main issue is I felt like the contrast was too strong. Uh, but I decided to run with this and see what I could do. So the first thing I wanted to do was bring back these darker areas, because this definitely got too dark. There's some information in there. And I did not want to get this area too bright. I mean, you see all this white in here? This white is really a uh, strong signal, a little bit too strong. So I definitely did not need to get this anymore, any more signal. So what I did is uh, sometimes to the, the best kind of mask to use in this case is actually just extracting the luminance layer, which is what I did here. So that's the luminance. Uh, I get that just by clicking that button. And then I applied this as a mask. So I made a clone. And here it is. Notice we have a mask applied. And if I uh, highlight the mask, this is what it's at. And so the brighter the red, the stronger the mask protection. So it's really just, it's like an inverse of the bright signal uh, in this target and these darker areas that I wanted to bring out or have less protection and so it's just a matter of using curves to kind of pull up the brightness so there it is And let's see, which mask do we sell? Okay, so I switched the masks, and this is just me wanting to hit certain areas. Obviously, we're wanting to hit uh, some of this white areas and darken them. And I ended up here. All right, uh, let's see. Let's make some space here because I did a little bit more work uh, from this point. Mostly curves work. So I made a clone again. Uh, let's get them to the same size. All right, so there's a mask. Obviously, I'm wanting to do some work on the uh, bubble, helmet, helmet top, whatever you want to call it. Now I'm wanting to do some subtle work here. See what this mask looks like. Yeah. Uh, again, it's all curves work. There might have been, I may have experimented with a little bit of unsharp mask to try to sharpen up some of these areas out here. I mean, so what differences do we see here? Well, we can see there's I definitely increased saturation because we're already got a bit more color in here. And what mask is on there now? Yeah, still working on that on the brighter spots. And ended up here. So not a huge difference. I mean there's a little bit of a difference. Right, so I, it's like once I got to this point, it was it, we were pretty much at the minor tweaking stage. This is really the point where it's time to go work on the stars and uh, put the images together. And so you can kind of see the history here. Um, I have four different versions of the starless image, and 
I've got four different versions of the stars. <laughs> so this is my first uh, combination of getting the stars back in there. And second one. I think at some stage I felt like the uh, overall color was maybe a little bit too purple. Uh, and really, I guess what we're talking about is the tint. And that is one of the changes that I made. Uh, let's see. So here's a starless version. Starless version. <laughs> Uh, I may have done a little bit more work on the reds to get them a little bit more red. Starless 3, so I had, I kind of waffled a little bit on what I wanted to do with the, the color of the O3. Right, how I uh, notice it's, it's getting a little bit greener so I maybe felt like I wanted more green actually this is probably the change in tint I did take it back into Photoshop back into the camera raw filter and just tweak the twin the tint a little bit uh, Starless 4 I think is the one that I ended up going with yeah you can definitely see more of a green it's interesting green uh, a lot of people seem to not like green if you're one of my regulars, you know that I um, uh, am a fan of green. Uh, if you look at my first shot, you could see this is in my my pre-green days, <laughs> where I'm pulling back on the green to give it more of a bluish red reddish look. But honestly, I think this color is closer to the actual O3 color anyway. So. Uh, especially on these planetary nebulae, I've kind of gone back to that. Alrighty, uh, let's see. I did do some experimentation on the stars, and I think instead of showing you the individual star images, right, because there's not, I mean, there's not much to see. Alright, so you can see I got a preview box there. Why do I have a preview box there? Well, if we look at these uh, two, um, I liked this one, but uh, the issue that I had is that the stars, while they're colorful, they're very tight. Uh, but this object is create has is really sculpted by uh, a, what do they call them? A wolf ray at star, right? A giant star, a massive star, uh, a very luminescent star, and this is the star in question, and it just kind of doesn't stand out. <laughs> so I thought it'd be kind of cool. I felt like this star needed to be bigger, but I didn't want the rest of the stars to be too big. So that's what you see here with stars for is I just created a mask and I just increased the size of this one a little bit. See, it's not a lot, but it's noticeable. I, it's definitely more noticeable. I didn't want it to get too blown out. Uh, but there it is. So that's the final image. This is the one I ran with. Uh, I posted this on my Instagram channel. I have not uploaded it to um, Astrobin yet, but it'll get posted there shortly. So overall, I think it. I think it came out all right. I'm. I'm. I may be tempted to revisit this target next year uh, when Thor's helmet makes it back into my night sky and build on this to see uh, what we can do with this fainter stuff in the background. Alrighty, so um, don't forget to like and subscribe and drop a comment if you have any questions about the processing I did or what are your thoughts on this uh, final image. How do you like the green in the center, that kind of teal color? Do you prefer the more uh, bluish red look? Uh, but anyway, uh, clear skies everyone.